welcome into Carpooling with Ben. Folks, whether you're from Southern New England or you're around the world, everybody right now, if you're a parent of students who are in school, whether it be public, private, charter, homeschool, you name it, whatever it is, school is a really hot topic right now. And today's discussion, I'm bringing on a blogger who's been doing something for a long time. Her name is Erica Sanzi. She has a wonderful blog out there, Good School Hunting. She's like I said, she's been on our local radio here in Southern New England, but really, I mean, the, the world is much bigger than just little old Southern New England or Rhode Island. So Erica, it's great to see you. Uh, happy 2021. Happy 2021, Ben. Thanks for having me. So you have been, as I mentioned, on the radio before. You've been on a lot of different panels. You're a educator. Uh, you you have former, in, former, former educator. educator. Well, do you ever really stop teaching? Well, you no, really I, I, am a, I am a mother to three children and two dogs, and I have a husband, so no. I give you the but I'm not, formally, I'm not formally in schools anymore. Okay. All right. So, well, let, let's dig into it, though. So what is your background? Because your blog is very popular. People love it for a variety of reasons. What is your background? Just to, so people who, who don't know. Thanks. And also, I should add, um, I recently am writing on Substack. Okay. which is that it's this new site that a lot of people are moving to. It's a free platform. I really like it. Um, so it's at um, sansy.substack.com. Okay. Um, I'm also trying to put everything I put there up on Good School Hunting. But for those looking, the blog is called uh, Sansy Says, and it's on Substack. And if okay. anybody wants to subscribe, I would be very grateful. We will um, link that in the comments. And I enjoy, you know, hearing back from people who agree and also who disagree. And there are many of each. Um, my background is uh, I went into teaching uh, sort of unexpectedly in my late 20s. I taught at, at a very um, affluent public high school in Massachusetts. Okay. And then my now husband, he got Navy orders to San Diego. So he was in Navy JAG. So we went out to San Diego and I taught at a high school out there um, on Coronado Island, which means that it was like a mix of like affluent families and military families, both children of officers and children of enlisted. So a very, very sort of diverse um, group. And one thing I discovered as soon as I left, the school I had been at in Massachusetts um, had the same number of students almost exactly as the school in San Diego. The one in San Diego had half the staff. Wow. So that was my first sort of like look at huge differences in funding. Um, California doesn't fund its schools based on local property taxes. So that was a big, that, that was a big difference. And so just to give an example, you know, I had been at a school where, you know, class sets of books were um, always available. Kids could always bring their books home. And then in California for the very first time, what I witnessed was seat reading where they didn't have books for kids to take home. So they literally read their novels for English sitting in their seats during class time. Wow. Um, yeah. I will but, tell you that as a person who has had ADHD his whole life, that would not have worked for me. Uh, that would have been a disaster. It's just, well, um, that is a disaster for a lot of students. Yeah. Uh, it, it, in fact, it came up this morning at my house because, you know, one of the problems in schools is that you have students that have finished much more quickly than others. And so then the question becomes for the teacher, well, what are the ones do who finish quickly? And at the moment, what a lot of them are doing is playing video games on their Chromebooks, which is a separate conversation, I think. But the point is oftentimes what they're told to do is have an independent reading book. And if you finish quickly, read your book. And my you know, decade working in schools is I have seen students for whom that no, that doesn't only work. They love it. I mean, there's always that student that always wants to be reading and they pick up their book and they read in class. I used to have students that would say, Miss Sandy, since I already totally understand this, it's okay if I read my book. But that is a small fraction of students. And the majority of students, um, and especially boys, just is what it is. Sure. This seat reading in class with that with distractions does not work. Um, so anyway, yeah, so that was very difficult for a lot of kids and I saw them kind of bouncing off the walls or they'd be on the same page for, you know, 25 minutes. Um, and then I came back to, um, after he finished his tour and our first son was born in San Diego, we came back and, um, my husband got a job in Providence. And so we decided to live between our parents and his work. And so we ended up here in Cumberland. Okay. 
uh, knowing pretty much nothing about the place, actually, other than the fact that houses were much more affordable than they were over the line in Massachusetts. Okay. Um, and then here I, um, I became really um, aware of before my oldest even started kindergarten, there was stuff was blowing up in town and I started to look at some academic data and I admittedly was incredibly ignorant because um, I was blown away at how poorly the academic outcomes were for students in Cumberland, you know, here in the place that I had just bought a house. Right. And again, so far, my, my trajectory was like super high performing school in Massachusetts. Then it was a much more sort of middling performing in San Diego. And then I came here and suddenly I'm like, why is this? Why am I suddenly, you know, realizing I'm living in a place where only 30 percent of the students are proficient in math? Right. Um, and that just sort of like set me on a a journey of of looking at student outcomes and also, um, I became also like sort of driven by this concept that I had grown up in a place where the schools were all you knew were really good schools, the facilities, the fields, the gymnasiums, the the resources, the um, the supplies, the instruction, the expectations. Yeah. And so when I came here, I kind of discovered I was in a place where the expectations were just lower. And what I mean by that is not only was the schoolwork less demanding, but the grass wasn't cut in front mm -hmm. of the, like, like things that are basic, yeah. it didn't seem like we were doing as good of a job. And while I do concede that funding plays a role in cutting the grass in front of school buildings, there are many things that I didn't see happening in schools that cost nothing. Sure. So, you know, responding to parents' emails or, yeah. um, you know, raising your expectations for students. Um, those would be two examples, right? So everybody kept saying, well, we don't have the money. And I was like, well, what do you mean? You don't have the money? You don't have the money to give, you know, rigorous work or expect, you know, you don't have the money to stop giving extra credit to kids for bringing in Kleenex, yeah. which then means that, you know, it looks like kids are doing well when you're just giving points for nothing. Right, um, right, right. So, yeah, I was really, um, you know, frustrated and it be, kind of became like in my head, it was always what I had. There's no reason I didn't do anything to deserve what I had had. And therefore, it, it kind of became like a mission to work um, towards all children, regardless of income, regardless of zip code, um, you know, having as close to what I had as possible. Sure. Well, um, I, I think that what you've just said everything that you've just laid out is you 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 i would imagine that as a parent you you kind of take that self blame and saying you know you said i was ignorant towards knowing the fact well let's face it erica you had a family you had little ones you were busy there's a lot of things happening and that's the same case for so many people and now let's pandemic aside it's just life is busy so it's not a, a fault of yours it's just one of those things like okay how many things am i going to juggle you've now taken this from a step back and if if what you just laid out is not reason enough to subscribe and follow <laughs> this i mean i i seriously don't know what is it i'm not saying that just to blow smoke at you i mean it from the case of even if somebody disagrees or maybe doesn't agree with every point you're doing such an amazing job at laying the different observations out and and coming from an educator side coming from a parental side coming from a person who's had different experiences that to me is the most incredible value in in what you offer and what you do uh what you've been doing this for a while what has been like the most popular or what is that one topic that I know if I hit this one topic, I'm going to, it's going to go right. The, the analytics are going to go right through the roof. More people are interested in this than anything else. What in your mind, what is What do you think that topic is? Uh, it, it depends if we're talking locally or nationally, but w w one thing I will actually say is I kind of exist in the, in the world of nuance and, I do see a lot of gray and that is not how you drive traffic, right? So 
it what drives traffic right nowadays really is can you get somebody to feel outrage or can you get them to respond viscerally right so uh to give you an example a, a piece that's done really you know pieces on the topic of restorative justice do really really well and just for listeners or viewers if they're not sure what that is you know it, restorative justice is this idea that rather than punish that you figure out a way to um, to to come to an understanding with a student that also involves a parent and a teacher that they're able to understand what it was that they did wrong, you know, why a fracture of some sort occurred because it often there's some sort of a fracture in a relationship and then they don't only own it but they work towards healing. Yeah. Now in a perfect world, that would work. Mm -hmm. The problem is restorative justice is one of these concepts that's become incredibly popular. And it's also become a way to drive down suspension numbers. And there's a huge pressure from the federal government to drive down your suspension and expulsion, but mostly suspension numbers, both in school suspension and out of school suspension, especially if your suspension numbers are gonna be higher for students of color or for students with disabilities. Okay. So what ends up happening is a school says, you know, oh my God, we got to, I mean, honestly, as soon as, the, as soon as there are um, those kinds of pressures, the natural tendency is to juke the stats. So, okay. you know, when the concern was graduation rates were too, too low, all of a sudden graduation, graduation rates rose. Could more kids read at graduation? No. Could more kids do math at graduation? No. So this kind of has happened a little bit with the behavioral stuff. So for example, what has happened is restorative justice, which can be very, very positive and successful when implemented correctly, when there's buy-in, when there are resources to do it well, and when the infraction is not something that put people's lives and safety in danger. But, it, but what happens is they say, we're just going to use it. And then they misuse it. And then you have, you know, story after story of children who've been, you know, relentlessly bullied, beat up. Um, and where the student that's doing that to them shows up in class again the next day, you know, or, or you know, taunts them and pushes them in the lunchroom the next day because, instead of there was no punitive action taken. And then they said they did restorative justice when they really didn't do anything. They just didn't want to suspend because they didn't want their numbers to go up. So essentially they kind of make their own definition to fancy the term and kind of sugarcoat something that, you know, and there's really no resolution because you haven't changed much is, is what I'm hearing you say. And I, I think yeah. I'm kind of, kind of on the right track there. And what is... you're all, and what you're also hearing me say is it's like a pendulum swing that goes too far. Right. So what happens is instead of saying, we're going to use restorative justice when that's the right thing to do, and we're going to use punitive measures when that's the right thing to do. And, um, and there's a woman in Rhode Island, I think her name is Melissa Ugarte, and she's like an expert in, in restorative justice. And so like when I ran a story from a mother who had just had this horrendous experience mm. and everybody reading it is like, this is awful. And then all these people reading it are going, oh my God, this is what happened to me. This is what happened at my school. This is what happened at my school. And all the anti-restorative justice people love it and they share it and it goes crazy. Um, but then I had a, a woman on, I had Melissa write a response because she works with restorative justice and she was able to identify that that the story that had been told was an example of how to do it incorrectly, right? So there's like a misunderstanding of what it is. There's a misunderstanding of how to use it. So that would be an example. Um, you know, some of the stuff that's gone bananas, I don't know if, if people who aren't familiar with me, you know, I've been fighting really this probably the third, maybe fourth year. You're very soft-spoken. I don't know if people know that. You're not, you're, you're kind of shy. You're kind of reserved, right? You, you don't really like to, to stir the pot at all, correct? Well, you know, I mean, no, I, I, I mean even... that. I mean, you are, you are, I, I, you are so. What I gather from reading your your blog and from hearing you, you are so in the corner of the children and the education experience. Maybe so, I'm wrong. No, you're not you, wrong. You are. You want at the end of the day, you want the child, the student, 
to have the best possible education experience possible on on a variety of levels. So I, I say that jokingly that you're quiet, you're reserved. No, you no, I it, get it. It's you're you're you are the the um, you're the advocate, the 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 ultimate advocate for on that side is the way I see it. Well, one thing people don't realize is that because education doesn't got, get a lot of attention in the national media, right? So they don't realize that actually probably one of the sort of most divisive, um, like where, where it's like a war. I mean, in, the, in education policy, it is like a bloodbath. Yeah. It is an absolute war. It doesn't make it on the national news. It never really rates as like a, t- you know, d- in the debates, they barely ever ask questions about education. But when I tell you that the special interests and the people's heels are dug in so hard. And so, for example, I am actually very misunderstood by a lot of people, particularly my detractors, because ed- education likes it puts people in these in these camps right? So you're in the charter camp and that's all you are, or you're in the union camp and that's all you are. Um, or you're, you know, you, you support school choice. That must mean that you want to destroy public schools. And the reality is, and there's, there certainly are people that are like extreme that way, but I'm an agnostic in terms of school governance. Last year, I had one son in my district middle school, one son in a charter school, and one son in a parochial school. That's, this year, uh, I have two kids in my block. district school, yeah, and one kid's in a pro. So the point is, I don't care where a kid gets educated. I don't care um, how that school is governed. You know, whether it's got. Uh, whether it's a charter school that, you know, in exchange for more autonomy has more accountability and mayors sit on the board versus a district school. I care about student outcomes. Mm. I, so I, and I also believe deeply in the concept that self-determination comes with having options. And when you chain families to their zip code, in terms of where their kids go to school and you make schooling compulsory by law. So if you don't send your kid to school, we're going to put you in jail, but the only school you can send your kid to for free is this school. That means that what you've essentially set up is, is a tiered system. And if you have money, you have access to options or you're zoned to a school that's good. And if you don't have money, and you don't have, uh, you know, uh, any way to access options via your income or the real estate market, you're trapped. Yeah. And, and the word literally is trapped. And so the reason that I do have a problem with a lot of people in these debates is that at, even generational failure is not enough for them to say, we really do think that parents deserve the the, the freedom and the self-determination that comes with having options. Because if you look in Rhode Island, almost all of the elected officials who live in Providence send their children to private schools or to classical. Okay. Yeah. And the reason is because they can stay in the city and say they live in Providence, mm-hmm. but they can escape from the Providence school system. Right. Well, why should they be able to escape? Yeah, you give the example of of Providence, and obviously, I'm sure that example is repeated 50 times over, uh, if not more, in the 50 different states. Uh, you know, so or, or anywhere really. It's uh, you oh, know, totally. We, if we, it's we if you're, it's, it, it's Oakland, it's Detroit, it's um, you know, obviously parts of Boston. It is. It is shameful. I mean, when you look at, there are high schools in Oakland where 0% of the students are proficient in reading. Zero. And in Providence, 6% of black boys in the eighth grade can read on grade level. Wow. That's so like we're, we're talking, and that's the same in Pawtucket. And, and in Pawtucket, I ran it, I, I wrote about it last night. I don't have it off the top of my head. It is in the single digits, the percent of eighth graders in Pawtucket who can do math on grade level. 
single digits. That's. I mean, so when we're talking, you know, yeah, you're, you're just you're you're, you're presenting. Uh, uh, we know what the outcome is going to be. We we know that without just and, and I'm not an expert. I, I never profess to be. I'm just saying this from an observer. The writing's on the wall, unfortunately. And the, the poor students that are in that category, the majority can't even read the writing on the wall because they can't read. I mean, that's Correct. the tough thing. And that's and it's amazing to see how this all plays out. And again, I, I go back to, you know, and I, and I we talked about this before we started taping. I'm not necessarily wanting you to present on this episode the, you know, what what is right, what's wrong. You're presenting this information uh, with with no nothing other than you want the positive the best possible educational experience for for the child uh which is which is honorable i think and, and incredible and um where does your background in education come from i kind of have always cared very much about social justice before social justice was like this the thing it is now right. which which has become a phrase that causes people to recoil because of sort of how it's been politicized and become something it's not. So, but, so I think it's partly that, right? I mean, I, I worked at a charter school in Providence. I, I, I've seen, I've worked among the wealthiest, the poorest, black, brown, white, you know, military, non-military. Sure. Um, and so when you've seen the disparities, mm -hmm. um, you, and you, and now the, these, these students, I mean, you, you love, you've, you've come to love the people that you're talking about, right? This isn't an abstraction. Right. So, and you've gotten to know their families, you know, and you've, and you've seen them cry their eyes out, or you've seen, you know, their parents beg you for help. Um, this is real. And, and again, like, I have noticed that a lot of the people that talk the most about social justice and equity, they don't talk about literacy. They don't talk about how few students can read on grade level, you know, and then they, they don't talk about the direct correlation between illiteracy and incarceration. You know, it's easier just to say, you know, you can talk about the school to prison pipeline all the time, as much as you want. You can blame it on um, unfair, uh, you know, behavioral practices, you know, you, you, you can say you're suspending too many of the black kids, but you really have to have conversations about all that is going on, yeah. right? You know, children who can't read on grade level act out, mm. right? And so, and when you act out, you get into trouble. And sometimes you get hit with a special education mm. diagnosis that you shouldn't have, but you get it because your behavior is, is you know, a disturbance. And then you end up, you know, that trouble escalates and now you're in juvie or now you're in prison and you want to, and then you realize then, and then you discover, or the somebody adult after you've been failed for 12 years discovers you can't read. Mm. So I, I think that part of it is we just miss the ball. We're not talking about the things that really, really matter. And it's largely because of the entrenched in interests of adults. For yeah. example, one of the reasons kids can't read is that our, our teacher training programs, for the most part, do not teach aspiring teachers how to teach reading. Mm. Does that make any sense? No. No, not at all. Not, not and at all. So, I mean, Rick has had a failing grade on this forever, and they keep saying that they've made changes, and maybe they have. But, I mean, 70% of the teachers come out of Rick, and we see no evidence that graduates coming out of there know how to teach reading in a scientific and evidence-based way. Wow. wow. But the adult interests, right? The school doesn't, you know, you know, do, do the professors want to have to change? Does the, does the, does the school want to change? You know, so you have these, these intractable problems about the comfort of grownups. Hmm. And then the children suffer and it's poor children and poor families who by far suffer the most. Because the rest of us, you know, okay, so my kid gets a bad teacher this year, I pay a tutor, you know, or I help him, depending upon what it is, you know, sure. or my husband helps him, or a grandparent helps him. Oh, or I happen to have a friend who used to be a teacher and she helps him, right? You have you have all this social capital. Yeah. But but for the families that don't have that, if school doesn't work for them, what is their other what is their alternative option? Right. No, you know, you're absolutely right. And uh and again, I'll take it back to, I think that your presentation through your blog, 
uh, through the uh, through whether it be on the Goodwill Hunting or the Substack that you're on now. It's Stanzi at Substack. Sanzi, S-A-N-Z-I dot Substack dot com. We will certainly link that, uh, Erica. I, I think I, I've always been highly respected this product that you present. Um, I am, uh, you know, for, for full disclosure, I didn't make it after I failed after my second year of seventh grade, I failed out. I was done. You talked about it a little earlier, actually, where it was, okay, some students, and this is a big thing we're facing with the pandemic right now. Some students were, are done before other students. So, okay, they want to go. I can specifically recall in fourth grade on Fridays at 11 o'clock was math and Fridays was test day. And if you got your test done, as soon as it was done, you could go outside for recess oh. before lunch. Done. Erica, guess what my goal was at 11 o'clock? It wasn't finished. It, it wasn't it wasn't a high grade on the test. It was Ben needs to get outside and run crazy because he is ADHD to the max. And I was always the first one done, but I was failing. Oh, I've seen that. I've seen so many times where where kids will rush and turn something in because there's something good waiting if they do that. Yep. And I can remember being like, well, I actually think it's a very bad practice to have, I mean, to set it up like that, right. it's a bad practice, but putting that aside, you look at the paper, you're like, yeah, this is blank. I just want to go outside. Yeah. Yeah. And kids, it, are and, kids. And, and that's especially for kids who need to move more. Um, it is increasingly difficult because the, the opportunities for movement in schools have been drastically reduced. Yeah. So you know, when I was in school, I'm 47. I don't know how old you are, but when I'm, we had two recesses um, and there was a lot more movement allowed throughout the school day. And they didn't expect nearly as much um, reading and verbal skill in kindergarten. So kindergarten was much more sort of hands-on play-based. Yeah, yeah. Now they're expecting students to be able to sort of sit still, pay attention and be passive as they engage in a lot of verbal skills. Yeah. And the truth is a lot of kids aren't ready. And because boys and girls brains develop at different rates um, is particularly when it comes to the verbal side of things. Sure. It has been an utter disaster for uh, many, many boys across the U S. Wow. Well, I mean, that's, that's a, that's just one small faction of all the content and information you put out there on your blog. Uh, Erica, now let's get to the real reason why I have you on <laughs> carpooling. Ladies and gentlemen, a few weeks ago, uh, Erica Sanzi tweeted, and I quote, just walked off with someone else's cart at the grocery store. So much for that 2021 resolution. I work from home, so I tend to do a lot of the shopping and the cooking and stuff. It's fine. It, it's no, it, it, that's how we roll in, in this house. I've never walked off with somebody's cart. Now, I don't have three boys. That doesn't matter. I'm there alone. <laughs> and by the way, this How does that happen? Me, I do this all the time. And it was, but what's weird is you said you had, so I also have an ADHD diagnosis, but I got it in my forties. I didn't have the hyperactivity, the physical hyperactivity. It's yeah. like, a, it's like a in my head hyperactivity yeah, yeah. that became, I just sort of discovered, it took me being a mother of three and working and realizing that a lot of things, mundane tasks that were very easy for a lot of my mom, friends, and peers were very difficult for me. Like I was screwing up the easy stuff, yeah, but yeah. then stuff that my friends thought was hard was, wasn't hard for me. So when you walk through the grocery store, I'm trying so because, to- Because I, because you leave your cart, like I, okay. So this happened in the meat section. Okay. So like I, I leave my cart somewhere and then this actually happens to me now that I think about it in a lot of stores. Cause I also often lose my cart oh. um, because you, you park and then you walk over to, you know, look at stuff or whatever. Gotcha. And then somebody else's cart is now next to you yeah. and you've forgotten that you left yours over there. And so you put your, you put your stakes into the cart that's next to you and you leave. Yeah, yeah. Now this was not a bad one because for two <laughs> reasons, one, I noticed it pretty quickly and there was no purse in it. The worst is when I walk off with people's carts and their purses. Yeah. I but the worst of all was at market basket last year and I was waiting in line and a man came up to me and he made a joke 
and he was holding up an, one item and he made a joke. And I was like, why is this weird guy talking to me? What is his problem? Right. Only to realize he says to me, look down. I look down. Nothing. I have his cart. I'm standing in line. Oh, my word. <laughs> at Market Basket with somebody yeah. else's shopping cart. And uh, so he goes, yeah, that's mine. He goes, and I think yours is way. <laughs> he had found mine while he was looking for his. No, it's a distraction Jeez. thing. Yeah. See, I... And I'll give you one more example of a distraction thing. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever gone to the drive through at Dunkin' Donuts, sat at the trash can, and wondered why it wasn't taking your order? Guilty. Thank you. Okay. Guilty. So, see, but I... it, that's because it looks like it. But here's the thing. I, when I go to the grocery store, do you, let me ask you this. Are you a push or are you a pull person? Both. Okay. Interesting. I'm a push and a pull person. All right. Um, But I... You know what I'm thinking? I wonder, maybe I should leash myself to my cart. You know, there's like, like tie myself because, and now in Target, this happens a lot because I, I start looking at clothes and then I go around and all of a sudden I have no idea where my cart is. And when I find it, it's like so far away. My resolution with Target is don't get a cart, don't get a basket. Then it's less, I have to go there for one thing and, and that's that's it. And I am like, you know, loaf of bread, uh, no, no. stick of butter, put that on the backpack back to that old Sesame Street cartoon. Uh, my wife and I, I, we only go to Target twice a year together. Everything else is separate because that's, 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 that's more how more than my husband and I, we don't go to, I don't think any stores together. It's uh, yeah. Well, we're, we're, we're still, we're still only five years, six years into um, our, our marriage here. So we're still young uh, in that sense. We'll both be 40 this year. Um, but I, I, yeah, I'm a, a pull person, but here's the thing. Like if I have a, like a niece or a nephew with me or something, um, I put the child in the basket and I push the basket backwards because the child spends, if they're, if they're young enough, they spend most of their time in the car riding backwards. So I figure the grocery store is the one place they can go forward if I think about it enough. So I'm usually pushing them, which gets fun because people get out of the way and they look weird and they get distracted and I just cut through and go for it. It's a good time. So I actually think I'd be less likely to lose my cart with my kid in it because I don't remember it ever happening when I had a child sitting in the cart. And on behalf of DCYF, we thank you. Uh, it's uh, no, that's 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 just the craziness. Of, when I saw that tweet, I'm like, I've never had that happen. I, I and and again, I. How many times do you, a week do you go to the grocery store? We are so far off the topic, but so a lot. Although I'm now, I I have a new um, thing I'm doing. It used to probably be like four times a week. Okay. But my new thing is to every Monday make the effort to go to Market Basket where the prices are so much better. Sure. And I think the service is awesome there. Mm -hmm. And, um, but that's like about 20 minutes for me driving. Yeah. But, um, so I'm trying to do a big shop once a week there. Yeah. And then the goal is to only grocery shop one other time that week more locally. Interesting. Okay. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm going five, six, sometimes seven days a week to the grocery store. It's, I just, there we have a small one in my town tom's which is great love the the people there are awesome you know we have the stop and shop next by we have the siabra we have the different options and stuff um so, but i we, and it could be because i have a small house and you know small covered space so it's not like we could stock up a ton of stuff but uh maybe that's the whole thing it's just i usually grab the hand basket and i'm just putting a few things and it's uh that well that thank be you a... because i've never lost the basket i only lose the cart but you but let's face it erica you've got a husband you've got three growing boys <laughs> your shopping is a little different than mine uh, well just and a, actually just a smidge and the and, and quarantine you know quarantine covid school from home has all created massive ma i mean the, the amount of food that families go through think about this my husband used to, and my kids used to leave at 7 30 in the morning and be gone for the whole day right now yeah. they're home all day which means yeah. they eat non-stop yeah so sure. another reason that i'm shopping a lot and trying to go to market basket to save money is because they're just ripping through food wow in fact today is i went monday it's now friday we are officially out of everything today was the day my kids two of my kids are back in school this week and so they go on wednesdays and fridays and so today it was like so pathetic trying to to, for them to find a snack to go with their sandwich because there's like nothing like all the good stuff was gone so the Tostitos, there were right. a few Tostitos left and they decided that, that, that that's what they would take. Here's some Tostitos. I also gave you a little vial here of green food coloring. Maybe you can make something work. I don't know. Uh, so I'm going to let you go in just a second so you can actually go do whatever grocery shopping you need to do and get out. And I am going to go today. So yes, I, I appreciate that. Last question I'm going to ask you uh, just for fun. 
when everything is back to normal, life is, you know, we're back open. Uh, you and your husband, what is the first concert you guys are going to go see together? Concert? I don't go to concerts. Go, go, okay, go. I'll try. I'll go to a concert. Yeah, please support the music, the people. The no, humans. no, I, I love, I do love music. All right. So we if, both if, love music. So and he you, has actually been playing the guitar a lot during this time oh. that he's home. Do you want to borrow one of my accordions? You guys could make a duet and do like, you know. Oh my goodness, the accordion. I don't know how to play the accordion. So, but if I had to pick a concert. Yeah. Hmm. This is a hard question for me. Um, how about this? You tell me which one you'd go to first while I think. First off, Walk Off the Earth. I have like rediscovered them. They're an incredible band out of uh, out of Canada. They create not only just regular songs with regular instruments, but they've also been doing all these recreations over time and they've done more of it. You know, they have uh, some of the members have kids, so they're using like, you know, xylophones and stuff. Modern day, they did like uh, 20 Beatles songs in seven minutes, merged them all together. It was incredible. Uh, that, and if I could, uh, just to feel normal again, I would love to go to a Dave Matthews band concert. I've been watching like videos of that from like back in the early 2000s where they're at like Central Park with thousands of people. It's like, ah, oh, as much as I can't stand the crowd sometimes, it's like, oh, I just want to be there just to feel normal again. So with that- So you feel normal at a concert? Well, I'm a musician. That's true. See, I don't like, so here's my, so let me explain my answer. I am not a big fan of large venue events or places. Okay. Like I went to Disney World kicking and screaming. Yeah. Um, and, I'm the same way on that. Disney. Um, yeah. And um, like, I, I kind of like prefer, I used to prefer going to the Paw Sox to the Red Sox. Not only well, thank, because. Thank you. Thank you. Not only because of your voice and the price, but like, um, so, but if I had to name people that I like to that I, that I would like to see, um, Dolly Parton. Okay. Um, Toby Keith. All right. Bruce Springsteen. I'm gonna have to give you a shout out next time I'm filling in on Cat Country ninety eight point one. For what? For just just hey, good morning everybody, and a and, special uh, shout out to my good friend Erica Sanders. I used to actually follower. I used to listen to that station. Um, and there's a new singer. I can't think. Well, he's not new, but he's new to me. Who's the singer? He sings the song um, Hurricane. It's um, oh, he's a country singer. Luke Bryan. Yes. Yeah. I kind of yeah. like him. I don't know much by him, but I like him. Brand new to the scene, not brand new, but relatively new to the scene. He he is he, he skyrocketing uh, towards the top before all this happened, and he's done well. He's done a lot of uh, a lot. Of, he, he's really good, very talented. As soon as things open back up, you'll you'll he'll be selling out Gillette. He'll be selling out the stadiums, absolutely. So uh, yeah, Luke Bryan is uh, and yeah, if huge. and ob and, and if not for her very untimely and incredibly sad passing, Whitney Houston. True is okay. a is a part of the soundtrack of my life naturally, naturally. and uh yes. and i and i don't hear her much but then if i put her on like if i intentionally put her on i realize i'm like i love all these songs i know all the words i'm now in the best mood so um you know yeah. if, if if that were to be possible very good but yeah Erica i don't Sanzi. have like cool i don't have like cool unique um <laughs> like um music taste and, yeah, and, friend, okay. and, and, and friends i know will they'll share like these are all the songs I listened to the most this year. Or, and I'll be like, I don't even know any of these, any of this. Yeah. Well, hey, no. listen, you know what? The fact of the matter is you have an incredible blog, and that's the main reason why I want people Appreciate to go follow you. Uh, folks, it, whether you have students currently in the system, will have them one day or had them in the past, and now you're an active member in your community, this is something you need to understand that not, not necessarily the specific cases, but the overall concepts, because no matter where you are in Southern New England, around the world, chances are Erica is writing about it. Erica, thank you so much for taking your time today. Uh, Thanks, you've ben. been a great sport and, and good luck with your shopping and, and may you not lose another cart for the rest of 2021. But if I do, I will think of you. I, that's uh, very depressing. So Thanks for thanks. having me. Have a great day. You too.